testing today is rather simple. It's, it's pretty similar to what we had since 1986 or so. A blood sample could be tested for the presence or absence of antibodies to HIV. First thing we do is a screening test, which is very sensitive. But anytime you screen large numbers of people, particularly low-risk people, you always get a certain number of false positives. If one were to test positive, then uh, one would do a so-called confirmatory test. It's also looking for antibody by using a, a, a more specific technique. The important thing in screening is to use one test to pick out the people who are probably infected, and then a second test called a confirmatory to be sure that you've got the right ones. And it's also important that they be done using different technology. So in the case of HIV screening, we use one kind of technology called the ELISA for screening and another kind of technology called the Western blot to confirm. Why is the Western blot considered, at least for now, the gold standard of verifying HIV infection? The Western blot is uh, considered as the gold standard because it, it, it is a very specific test. Uh, based on the criteria that are established by expert organizations, a certain profile will indicate infection in 100% of the cases. So that if we use the Western blot and we look at the profile that's produced, the antibody reactivity against certain antigens or proteins of the virus, um, that profile uh, is found to be accurate 100% of the time, or nearly 100% of the time um, when that profile is present. So the Western blot is the gold standard in the sense that uh, we, can, we can judge and, and, and base our estimate uh, or predict whether a person's infected to a high degree based on that profile. Now you kind of touched on it, but can you just tell me what exactly does the term gold standard mean in scientific? The, the term gold standard um, is a very difficult term to, to actually define. Uh, what it actually means is the best test or the best measure we have uh, currently available, whether that measure be uh, growing the virus to confirm that somebody's infected. Um, however, gold standards by themselves aren't necessarily 100% accurate. In fact, there are no gold standards that are really 100% accurate. There's always exceptions. But a gold standard is the best test we have in which to compare a new method. The scientific literature clearly shows that there are about 70 different conditions that can cause a false positive HIV test, and some of those conditions are quite common. Uh, this is from Infectious Disease Clinician of North America, 1993. Human or technical errors, other viruses, and vaccines. Have you ever had a flu shot? Archives of Internal Medicine, August 2000. Liver diseases, parenteral substance abuse, drug abuse, hemodialysis or vaccinations for hepatitis B, rabies, or influenza. It's from the journal Transfusion in 1988. Unpasteurized cow's milk, bovine exposure, or cross-reactivity with other human retroviruses. Renal failure, liver disease, blood transfusions. Syphilis and malaria, autoimmune diseases are notorious for interfering with some of these tests and perhaps producing a false positive result. You can test positive if you've been exposed to the tuberculosis microbe, or um, it, not just if you've got TB, but if you have a, a friend, a close contact who's got TB. Hypogammaglobulinemia, it just means increased levels of antibodies in general. Pregnancy, 
which is um, well known to produce false positive tests to many antigens. Uh, multiple blood transfusions is another one. Any reason to get false positive Western blot tests? Archives of Internal Medicine, August 2000. Causes of indeterminate blot, Western blot tests include lymphoma, multiple sclerosis, injection drug use, liver disease, or autoimmune disorders. Also, there appears to be healthy individuals with antibodies that cross-react. The Western blot is not used as a screening tool because it yields an unacceptably high percentage of indeterminate results. It is true that there's many publications in the literature uh, that speak of false positive test results on HIV tests due to a multitude of different factors. However, I want to emphasize that the term false positive is really a misnomer because there is no test for HIV. So if we can't say which sample is truly infected and which one is not infected, then how can we judge whether or not another test is scoring falsely positive or truly positive? The specificity of these tests have not been scientifically evaluated. And this should have been done before they were introduced into clinical practice. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. Credit must go to our eminent doctor, Robert Gallo, who directed the research that produced this discovery. What was new that day is for the first time we were saying, that's the cause, I'm sure. And we have a blood test that'll protect the blood supply tomorrow. Once we got away from screening blood to actually trying to diagnose people, we were able to use screening tests. The early way that was done in the 80s was they took the virus, they grew it up in some cells, and they took that gamicious cells and virus and put it down into an assay. To, and so it had all the normal cell material and all the pieces of the virus. And if, when you added serum from human beings, in that serum was antibody, if it recognized any of the cell gamish or any of the viral proteins, it would bind and you get a reactive test. So the, the original ELISAs in those days, and many of these screening tests, could only tell if you had a reaction to any of the gamish or, or to the virus itself. Couldn't tell which it was. How was Gallo's first test? Was that accurate? Uh, the first test developed by Bob Gallo and his colleagues at NIH was quite inaccurate. I think the Abbott test was not very specific at the beginning. For example, in the Defense Department, if you were reactive by the screening test uh, and a low-risk population joining the military, two-thirds of those people were really not HIV infected. But today, the ELISA type assays have greatly improved in their uh, percentage of accuracy and are somewhere up in the 99.99% you know, range. It's very, very high. The test is 99.9% .9 accurate, um, but for what? The question is, for what? This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. In 1985, at the beginning of the HIV testing, it was known that 68 to 89% of all repeatedly reacted HIV antibody tests were, were false, some 70 to 90%. At the beginning, they only used the ELISA, and we were worried for a while because we felt certain that a backup was necessary. As a consequence, we got in the habit in the U.S. of every time you got a positive result with an ELISA assay, you would then do a Western blot, which was a more precise, more expensive, more difficult test uh, to confirm it. So you'd, you'd, you'd have some certainty that, that you were getting a, you know, a meaningful result then if they both came positive. In 92, the Lancet reported that for 66 tr true positives, there were 30,000 false positives. And in pregnant women, quote, there were 8,000 false positives for six confirmations. 1996, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the diagnosis of HIV infection in infants is particularly difficult 
because there's no reference or gold standard that determines, without doubt, the true infection status of the patient. In 2000, the Journal of AIDS reported that either 2.9% or 12.3% of women in, this, in their study tested positive, quote, depending on the test used. But since there was no established gold standard test, it's unclear which of these two proportions is the best estimate of the real prevalence rate. No, I think they are very good tests, very accurate, very sensitive everywhere, you know, in the United States, in France, in Europe, everywhere. And they're also rapid tests as well. If an ELISA is positive, it does not mean that the patient is HIV positive. That's a problem. I don't think the Western blot is a useful diagnostic test. I don't think it's worth doing. We always say to our clients, even if you have tested here, you can go to other centers and go and test and verify your test. You cannot say you're 100%, because you find clients going from area to area doing tests. And they come with stories that I was negative at a certain area, I'm positive with you. How do they de de decide whether they're positive or negative? We cannot tell, because we are using a rapid test. It's interesting to see how the language has changed in the manufacturer's test kits over time. In 1994, Abbott Laboratories states the etiological agent, or the causative agent, of AIDS is a retrovirus called HIV. Uh, by 1996, uh, they have changed this language to state epidemiological data suggests that AIDS is caused by HIV. More recently, a manufacturer of a, um, a rapid test kit uh, called OraQuick states, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is thought to be caused by the human immunodeficiency virus. And then even more recently, the manufacturer of a, another ELISA states, published data indicate a strong correlation between AIDS and a retrovirus referred to as HIV. So you can see the language has been loosening up in these package inserts as time has been progressing. In some tests, for example, from a well-known company in the United States, which actually produces uh, the most widely sold um, ELISA test, they state that, um, beside their test being very reliable, they state there is no recognized standard to establish the presence or absence of, an a of HIV antibodies in, in human blood. I'm not a technician, but I wonder, what that means if the company who is producing and selling the test is not even aware of how to verify their, the reliability of their test by admitting no one in the world, according to their knowledge, has any established recognized standard to verify whether their test is reliable or not. Just to give you a very stupid example, if I would use a pregnancy test and the package insert of the pregnancy test would say this is a very reliable pregnancy test, but there is no recognized standard of establishing the presence or absence of a pregnancy, I would be kind of reluctant to use the test and I would wonder why the company selling the test, a test, when they can't verify how reliable it is. And of course, there are means and ways to verify presence or absence of a pregnancy. We have a gold standard. So we can verify whether a test is reliable or not. And obviously, at least the main, the main company in the world producing and selling these HIV tests is not aware of a recognized standard. I find that troubling from a clinical point of view. Some people argue that, um, that we have a confirmatory test in some parts, some Western countries, and that repeated testing can lead you to a safer diagnosis. Um, but if the very basis of the test is faulty, then nothing works, in fact. The confirmatory test is a bit more uh, sophisticated, in which you take the virus and you break it up into its different components and you put it on a strip that separates the different components, and it's called a Western blot. So the Western blot actually looks at bands of the proteins. When there is 
an interaction of the antibody with the viral protein in question, let's say the viral protein that's called P24, or the envelope we call GP120, when you see bands lighting up, well, those are surely the viral proteins because they're scoring of exactly the size that we know the viral proteins to be. And you only see those bands when the antibody has interacted with them. When you're looking at this, this Western blot, how do you determine what is a positive? You need a certain number of bands being present. It depends a little bit on the producer of the test. It depends on the manufacturer. Is, yeah. is there different criteria for what might be a positive? Yeah, there are different criteria from the manufacturer. <laughs> Thank you for the word. And also um, there are guidelines from the WHO and UNAIDS. Claudia showed me the package insert that comes with the Western blot. It contains eight different sets of criteria for diagnosing HIV infection. Because of the different criteria that apply in different countries, you can be considered, you can test HIV positive in one country and be given an AIDS diagnosis as a result of that, whereas in another country you won't test HIV positive and you won't be given an, an AIDS diagnosis. It's ludicrous that you can be positive in one country and not positive in another. This is where the argument was early on, is how do you define criteria? In the early days, um, be, uh, people actually uh, developed criteria that were too much like a screening test. So if you had just P24, they might have caused, called it a positive. Many people were diagnosed using these criteria, and then it was realized that 40% of people have who are completely healthy have one or more Western blot bands, most commonly a P24 band. We don't know how many thousand people were tested using the Western blot, that, that Western blot criteria before 1987, but it, it, it invites the question, shouldn't they all be tested, shouldn't they have all been tested when the criteria changed after 1987 in case they were no longer positive? Because after 1987 that wasn't good enough to make you HIV positive. So there are probably people out there who would not be positive on the criteria which developed subsequently. Yep. What was the criteria pre-1987? P24 or P41 or both. And, and people were diagnosed just with one. People had to learn how to, what's the right criteria for reading Western blots. If you actually go back and look at the document you know, over time, those criteria changed. Up until 1993, the FDA criteria were a lycoprotein like band plus P24 plus P32. They actually specified what the bands were. Now, using the FDA criteria, which existed before 1993, only 80% of AIDS patients had a positive test. That is, they had a, po a po positive Western blot test, which means that 20% were not positive on the FDA criteria. Wait, was it 80% tested positive? 80% tested positive, 20% didn't on the FDA criteria. Is that one that had AIDS? That had AIDS, clinical AIDS, yes. Okay. okay. Now, in 1993, the FDA changed their criteria. They dropped the, the, the need to have P32. What was the result of the change? They had more positives on the FDA criteria. There were more positive tests. The FDA criteria were said to be the most specific, but they weren't the most used. The CDC criteria are the most used in the United States, which means that people were not tested in the United States using the most specific test. There are specific criteria for um, interpreting Western blot results. And uh, specifically, if you don't have the three um, bands, the three major HIV bands, P24, GP41, and GP12160, then it still would not be a positive result. The one we're using here is where we have at least two of three major bands appearing in here, and at that point we'll call it a positive. Most people that are infected, most people will have a full profile against all the viral components. 
in order to limit the number of false positives, how come they don't just, in terms of the Western blot, how come the criteria isn't just all nine proteins? If you react with all nine proteins and you're positive, how come it's only limited to three? I don't know the answer to that. It's probably because they're harder to see on some of the other bands that are overlapping with some other proteins, but like I, I don't know. Okay. In an effort to make the Western blood a little more specific, do you think we should maybe up the bands to like four, four or five? There's constant discussion in the community of people who do diagnostic testing and the blood bankers about how to read these tests. And you can get together a group of people and they may or may not agree. So all these tests are read in a way that we think is the optimal reading, but it's not ever going to be perfect. Why don't they up the criteria from two bands, like four or five? I don't think the Western blot is a useful diagnostic test. I don't think it's worth doing. But it's a useful prognostic test. Once you know that someone is infected, then you can follow their antibody response as well with Western blots. You're looking forwards into how the patient's going to do in the future in a prognostic test. Diagnostics say, is the patient infected or not? You don't need a Western blot. And it's become a dogma in HIV research that you need one ELISA followed by a Western. You don't. You need two different kinds of ELISAs made in two different formats. Uh, Western blots have been sort of promoted into some sort of holy grail. This has a margin of error done properly that's extremely low. In other words, it's one of medicine's better tests. If the Western blood is such a great test, why isn't it used in England? I mean, Philip Mortimer, who's the director of their National Reference Laboratory in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom, says that it, it began and, uh, and should have remained a research tool. So you ask some of your experts in the United States if it's such a great test, how come the English don't have to use it? I don't know. I can't comment about that because I'm not really sure what, why they did that. Oh, okay. I'd hate to make a comment about another country's practice when I'm not really sure what okay, they're doing. No problem. Okay. We have a group now of about 40 patients that have no detectable virus in their body, but they're not being treated. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, are they really infected? So the Western blots can have false positives? No, the Western blot was negative, too. But they were told they were positive by a lab, yes, that misread the Western blot. There are other proteins in the body that sometimes react and cross-react, so that when you take the antibody from a normal person who doesn't have any antibody to HIV, and you allow it to react either in the ELISA or in the Western blot, you may see an, a nondescript, indeterminate band that could be a false positive test for HIV. If one person interprets a Western blot differently than another person, that sure will change the specificity of the test. Uh, if you're calculating how many times was the test right or wrong, uh, but somebody's reading it wrong all the time, then the test is going to look much worse uh, than if somebody else had read it correctly. So uh, technical errors, uh, subjectivity, all these things do come into account and into looking at the true utility of a test or, or what its value is. In Australia, you need four particular bands to have a positive Western blot. So if you have three, it's not positive, okay? But when you get the fourth band, it is positive, which means all those bands are due to genuine HIV antibodies. But if you only have three, they're not due to genuine HIV antibodies. So why is it adding the fourth one makes the other three genuine? I mean, it's a, it's a puzzle, isn't it? Why can't the fourth band be non-HIV as well? Why can't all the bands be non-HIV? Since a false positive looks like a true positive, how can you ever distinguish whether it's truly a positive or a negative? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's going to be very hard to determine uh, a false positive. Heavyweight champion Tommy Morrison tested positive in 1996. Eleven years later, in 2007, he tested negative multiple times, allowing him to return to the ring.
the most important thing in this whole debate centres around the fact that antibodies react with more than one antigen. And antigens react with more than one antibody. And when you have one or more things reacting with the same thing, you can't identify it. So I thought I'd illustrate this problem, because it's an important problem, with some simple kitchen chemistry. And we can imagine that we're doing an antibody test, but instead of using an HIV test kit with its proteins, we're going to use some milk, which contains proteins. And we're going to put some proteins in this serving dish. And we're going to add two different things which react with the proteins in this milk. So I'm going to take this lemon. I'm going to squeeze some of the lemon juice into the milk. I'm going to shake it around. And you can see it's getting thicker all the time. That this lemon juice has reacted with the proteins in this milk and produced a precipitate. This is how we know there's been a reaction, because there's a physical alteration in the reaction mixture. Now, I'll do the same thing with vinegar. Okay? Entirely different substance from the former. And I add some vinegar to another specimen of milk. And I wait a little while. And we see identical appearance. Because so I'm going to put some lemon juice and some vinegar in either of these cups. I'm going to do it out of view of the camera, and I'm going to do a third experiment. I know what's in these, but you don't. Now I'm going to add one of these. Unsurprisingly, we also have a precipitate. Now, which one did I add? You can't tell me, can you? No. So when you have two antibodies that react with the same antigen, you can't identify which antibody it is. Here I've only got two different substances. In serum, there's hundreds of different antibodies, each with the potential to react with an antigen, the same antigen. So when they say that they recognize that there is the ability for cross-reactions in HIV tests, they must have a way of identifying what is a cross-reaction and what isn't. The problem is this. Antibodies can react with many different antigens and an antigen can react with many different antibodies. Once you let that into the equation, you can't tell, you can't identify one from the other. So you have to set it, that's, 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 that's the guts of the problem. That's the essence of the problem. You've no grounds for saying that anybody is HIV positive. It's just a, a, a contradiction in terms. You, you cannot say that these antibodies that are looked for with the so-called HIV tests represent the presence of a specific virus that has never been proved. Are you saying that the millions of people that have tested positive aren't necessarily positive for a virus that they're told is going to kill them? That is possible. Definitely. Are you saying that they're there is no gold standard and that's why the tests are so flawed. There is a gold standard. The gold standard is HIV as proven by HIV isolation. But when you search the scientific literature, there's no, there no data published on this. There's no data where they compare the presence or absence of the antibody tests, presence or absence of reactivity with the presence or absence of the virus as, as proven by isolating it. Here, you do not see anything about uh, the details, but I would say it's probably a virus. These are HIV here? Yeah. Oh, the, so the, are the, these HIV too? Yeah, yeah. Everything's probably, probably. Probably. Yeah. What can I tell you? You know, I mean, it, it exists. <laughs> yeah, I said he had all these viruses, and it was a lie. I think HIV totally has turned out not to be the cause of AIDS. HIV has turned out not to be. Can you explain the process of HIV isolation? Well, I didn't Dr. Gallo do that? I mean, he actually isolated it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why should I do all of this? This is all textbook stuff you're asking me. I'm not quite sure what's behind your question about isolation. I don't want to be your textbook, you know? Okay. I got other things to do. Today, we have not yet proof for the existence of 
any of the HIV proteins. And if you don't have proof for the existence of viral proteins, you cannot have proof for the existence of the virus. Is it your belief with the current tests that we have today, the fourth generation tests that they say are so specific and so accurate, that it's completely impossible to determine whether that's a cross-reaction or an actual positive? Well, you know, the fact that they have third or fourth, <coughs> sorry, second, third, fourth generation tests is modifying the antigens or the actual methodology in the test kits. What counts is whether the antibodies truly are as a result of infection with the retrovirus HIV. And the only way that you can prove that is to use HIV itself as a gold standard. That's true of any test. I could give you the example of the pregnancy test, where, you know, if you, it's a, it's a blood test for pregnancy, which is pretty good, but it has to be proven to be good before you can say it's pretty good. And the way you do that is that you test a whole lot of women uh, with a test and you score their results positive or negative. Uh, and then you see how many of them have a baby or don't have a baby and you can cross correlate them using the baby as evidence of pregnancy. It's totally independent of the test. Okay? And when you do that, you find that the pregnancy tests in fact are highly accurate. They're not perfect, but they are pretty accurate. In this case, we can think of HIV as the baby. Okay? And we've got an antibody test and we've got HIV and we want to see if the test is specific. And to do that, we would expect when we actually uh, test for the, uh, do the antibody test, we only ever find a positive test in someone who's infected with the virus. We would, we would ex never expect to see someone who's uh, not infected with the virus with a positive test. And that's the only way we can put the numbers into the equations, is by having those two sets of data. So we've got the test, that's no problem. We define what a positive test is, whether it's one band, two bands, ten bands, one ELISA, one Western blot, whatever, whatever our test algorithm is, and then we compare it with what we're looking for. So I think the, the answer to your question is we, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know. In 1994, Audrey Serrano tested HIV positive. While initially healthy, she was prescribed AIDS drugs, which nearly killed her and left her scarred for life. In December 2007, after multiple negative tests, she was awarded $2.5 million in damages. People claim these tests are 99.99% specific. So we need to really understand what does specific mean. You know, it's a word thrown about and used a lot. And specific means that the thing that you're talking about has only one cause. An analogy that I sometimes use is if you see a vehicle driving down the street and all you see of it is a little bit of the bonnet and a three-pointed star, you know instantly what that vehicle is. It's, it's so well known, I don't even have to tell you what it is. Correct? Correct. But if, I, if you see, if you're walking along the road and you see a tyre, then you can't say what vehicle that came from, because all vehicles have tyres. So the three-pointed star is specific, highly specific for a particular thing, in this case a Mercedes-Benz, whereas a tyre is not. So in our view, because antibodies cross-react, because non-HIV antibodies can react with the HIV proteins, and the HIV experts themselves don't dispute this. That's the reason, for example, that 40% of people have a one, at least one Western blot band. Uh, when, you, when you have this situation, you have to assume that all the antibody reactions are non-specific and then prove that they're not. And you do that by using a gold standard. That is what you're, what you're saying the test is testing for, in this case, HIV. It's 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm a little nervous because I'm about to go in for my first HIV test. Tell me about your sex life. My sex life? Us? Um... Yeah. What is the purpose of risk assessment? Well, you're right to get an indication whether we have to expect a positive result or not. Any other way that you have exposed yourself, and you feel you might have contracted HIV virus since you're here? No, I I'm not gay, and I've, I'm not a hemophiliac. Uh, I've never had a blood transfusion, and I've never used intravenous drugs. So I don't. I think it's impossible for me to have it. 
What's great about a rapid test? Well, they're less expensive and they're very quick. And we know that cheap and fast is always a sign of high quality. These tests claim to be HIV tests. I'm going to read from a section that's called, that says limitations of the test. The specificity of the reveal rapid HIV antibody test for blood specimens in low risk populations has not been evaluated. They don't know, in their terms even, how well this test is going to work in people they don't want it to work in. Low risk. We don't think you're at risk. Rapid tests in Germany, it's not allowed for standard diagnostics. May I ask why, how come you don't use rapid tests for standard diagnostics? Several professional organizations who decide as an expert committee on guidelines how to okay. do things. None of these responsible uh, societies recommended for scientific reasons. This is, what, this is the language all these tests use. A reactive test result using the reveal HIV antibody test suggests, that's nice, the presence of anti-HIV antibodies. That's good. Okay, we suggest that you're going to die soon. The reveal rapid HIV antibody test is intended to be used as an aid, an aid in the diagnosis of infection with HIV. But it's the test. I thought it was an HIV test. No, nope, it's just an, it's, it's a helper. How does it help? Here's how it helps. Results of the MedMirror reveal test should not be used in isolation, but in conjunction, in conjunction with the clinical status, history, and risk factors of the individual being tested. How do you decide how to interpret as a technician? What do you do? I will ask in addition, is there a pregnancy? Is there any allergy known? Is, is there additional information to, make, to have more information on if it could be cross-reacting antibodies or true infection? The problem is that we can't distinguish between a false positive and a true positive HIV test. The tendency is to call it a true positive if somebody's in one of the risk groups. And for sure, uh, the first question is, is there risk? This I didn't even talk about, but it's one of the very first questions. Is there risk for infection? Okay, and uh, is that the risk assessment section? Yeah. If you have risk factors, like you admit to being gay and to having had sex recently without a condom, you're suddenly at high risk. And this test is very meaningful for you, say we. You come in, you're a straight guy, come from a good family, you're a little worried because you had a, a European fling, but she was a nice girl. Nah, don't worry about it. So, did the answers to these questions help aid in the diagnosis? Oh, of course they did. Really? They do. This is from a, a journal called AIDS Alert. It's about the rapid test. If the same test was performed on a thousand white, affluent suburban housewives, a low prevalence population, in all likelihood, all positive results will be false. If the same test was performed on a thousand white affluent suburban housewives, all positive results will be false. They'll be positive, but they'll be false. Why? Because we say so. That's why. We say who's positive. We interpret it our way. It really says that? The last bit I said. We interpret it our way. No, but it really says the housewives? If the same, let me read you the whole quote. Whether the test will perform as well in the United States as they have abroad is still unknown, experts add. Well, why might tests work well abroad? Because we assume everybody who tests positive, we're just going to say they're positive. Here, it's different. For one thing, using a single rapid test in a low prevalence population will give a lower positive predictive value. That error rate won't matter much in areas with a high prevalence of HIV because in all probability, the people testing false positive, positive, will have the disease. They'll be testing false positive, but they'll have the disease. We're assume, we know they have the disease anyway, and the test result doesn't matter. That's what that means in English. Welcome to AIDS doublespeak. But if the same test was performed on a thousand white, affluent suburban housewives, a low prevalence population, in all likelihood, all positive results will be false, and the positive predictive value plummets to zero. That's from uh, AIDS Alert magazine, uh, coming to your clinic, candidate for rapid test. What that means is they, t they look at a group and they say, there are this many people with AIDS in this area. And, you know, we define AIDS clinically again. We say that you have AIDS because we say that you fit the criteria now. And when we say that you fit the criteria, we say that the tests work better. 
I know that rapid tests are used in African countries. If you have a high prevalence of HIV infections, you have less risk to, to pick up false positives. Okay. Which might happen in countries like Germany with prevalence below 1%. Oh, so that makes a big difference in screening for HIV. So in a low prevalence yeah, group, you don't want to use rapid tests? Yes, you know, because you pick up more easily you, you, the, the false reactives in the first essay, in the screening essay. Okay. The way that they pitch these tests is they, they try to get them to be most reactive with the people who they think are more likely to be infected. There's an a priori assumption going on. I'm going to look at the black community and I'm going to make tests and when I test them I'm going to make sure that I get the strongest reaction for whatever reason I don't need to know with the blood that I draw from these various communities. The Knowing is Beautiful campaign is, is one of the many uh, pro, you know, go get tested, it's responsible campaigns put out by little political action communities like, uh, committees like AMFAR. And the idea is to tell everybody to go get tested, but it's not everybody. They're not interested in saying everybody. Like, for example, you don't, you don't see the big ad uh, at the bus stop in Beverly Hills. Knowing is beautiful, be responsible. You don't see it in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. You don't see it on the main line in Philadelphia. You don't see it in La Jolla, California. You don't see it in Burbank. You know, I mean, you see it where? In the inner cities. Uh, you go into downtown Philadelphia, the whole thing is like, uh, you know, AIDS land. Uh, you go, go into the Castro, AIDS land. You see so many ads for doing the responsible thing. Why? Because we believe for some reason that some people when they have sex, will also die. <laughs> but some people won't. We forget that there's a long history in humanity of actually reproduction. You know, there was that thing called the Crusades where people went all the way from Europe into Persia. They had lots of sex with a lot of people. They didn't have a Knowing is Beautiful campaign. Yeah, people probably didn't have AIDS. A lot of people probably died anyway. Uh, you look at now, we have this idea that these people, these very specific people, need to get tested so that they can be sort of monitored and we can help them, I guess, by, by drugging them, you know, by offering them drugs. Yes, but we, we know that once they get tested, if they test reactive and we say that's positive, we know that they're going to die. We know that. You know, so it's really a, a great gift we're giving, if you see what I mean. The, the test makers are very clear, though, that we don't want to test in La Jolla. We want to test maybe in downtown San Diego, where uh, a lot of the young uh, gangbangers live, a lot of the young Mexican kids live. Uh, we want to test in uh, uptown uh, New York in the 170s, where a lot of the Dominicans live. Certainly not in the 70s, uh, where you know on, uh, where the nice you know newspaper publishers and all these sorts of cable magnets live. Do you know the one that says, are you positive, you're not positive? Do you, do you know whose picture is on that? A black girl's. And a black guy's. I mean, I, I have them right here. Are you positive, you're not positive? Right there. I'll, I'll give you the picture another time. But are you positive, you're not positive? And here's one that says, the new face of HIV. It, but it doesn't say that. It says, la nueva cara de VIH. It says it in Spanish, and there's a picture of a young Latino girl. The Knowing is Beautiful campaign is an idea that somehow using tests that don't register anything specific is a meaningful thing to do to stop the problem of what we consider to be a sexually transmitted disease that's clearly a toxicological, multifactorial problem. But we're very clear about who we want to have tested. And the medical literature is even more clear about it. I think I would like to ask the question, do you really believe that after these many millennia uh, of life on Earth, you know, in 1983 or 4, a, a virus came out, you know, like a new product, that would be sexually transmitted, but only among the, like Latin and, and maybe black people and gay people? Gay men have been targeted for testing. In other words, uh, 
the general population of the United States, there has never been the mass pressure, get tested, take an HIV test. But gay men, the propaganda there is everywhere. And so, of course, the more people you have taking the test, the more positives you will get. And to me, this is, is a very sinister development or very sinister uh, phenomenon. The, the gay AIDS establishment and the medical community that serviced the AIDS, the gay AIDS community, marketed the HIV test as the critical sign of whether you cared about yourself, whether you wanted to live or not. Um, and it was very hard for anyone who was concerned about their health, particularly anyone who had lived any, any form of this lifestyle that, that was being called into question um, to resist taking this test. You had doctors who refused to treat patients who didn't take the test. You had doctors who refused to treat people who had taken the test, who refused to take the, the AZT that was available. They would drop the patient. This is, this is what the Denver Principles was about. Because there's nothing worse than having, you know, your medical provider is supposed to be someone that you trust and that you think is going to help you. And when they suddenly abandon you because you haven't followed their direction, it, it changes the relationship between the patient and the, and the doctor. Because that's supposed to be a partnership. The doctor is supposed to give you his advice or her advice, and you're supposed to make a decision based upon that. And if you say no, that medical provider is supposed to respect your position. That changed with AIDS, because you were not being a good patient if you didn't do the HIV test, if you didn't do the drugs, of the drug at the moment that was being told. If you didn't do those things, then you wanted to die. You know, you want, that's a, you know, the person is afraid of dying, you know, is terrified of dying, a young person, these, we're talking about all, almost all young people, who's terrified of dying, to be told, if you don't do this, you're going to die, and I don't want to have anything to do with you. That happened over and over and over again. And that's why when the PWAs got, nationally got together for the first time in Denver, I think it was 1986, and drew up the Denver principles, one of the first things in those principles was, we have a right to say no to our medical provider and uh, to be respected and to be continue to have a relationship with that medical provider.